I don't deserve his love, but he's always been there for me. You see, Jesus met me when I was at my lowest. And if you don't know Jesus, know this. He's the greatest example of generosity this world has ever seen. And when Jesus hit the scene, he changed the scenery and met diversity with serenity. If you're in need of peace, he offers plenty. When the angels sing, they sing of the grace that was displayed for sinners like me. I can't explain him, and I can't describe him, but if I could, he wouldn't be Jesus. You can't comprehend the galaxies, but it was his loving hands that spun them into, into existence, knowing that he would go to the cross to pay our sentence. Yeah. Right. There was a certificate of judgment after the sentence. After the sentence. He was sentenced to death long before he said it is finished. He is a father to the orphan, a shelter for the homeless, a hiding place for the abused, and an anger for our storms. He stormed the gates of hell and came out on top, and the power of his gospel could not be stopped. Even when the world dries, and they dry a lot. He traded places with Barabbas and made the, it became the catalyst across the world covering every portion of the atlas. If you're in need of rest, I know it matters. If you don't know Jesus, your future is tragic. But he gladly embraced tragedy that we could live in his presence of majesty. His, his presence, his presence. And it's his presence that produces preciousness to a world of peasants. He's far from pretentious, but still loves those who are. He is the light of the world and he hung the stars. He brings the dead to life and delivers life to the dead. He took a crown of thorns on his head so we can put crowns on his feet. And I can't wait till the day I can kiss his feet that will nail to a cross for me. He loves the world and I love his word because his word became flesh and in the flesh he demonstrated the words of the world. He is an example to every boy and every girl. He is a lover of black people. He is a lover of white people. He is a lover of the unchurched and the assembly of the people. He doesn't see the believer's failures, but still takes time to celebrate their faithfulness. The power of the Spirit enables us and gives us the boldness when the world labels us. Yes. If you want to label me, please label me a Jesus freak. And if that freaks you out, good. Because it's better to be good with God than to be misunderstood by a world that can never understand. Amen. Yeah, wow. Although he doesn't need us, but he still pleads for us to run to the cross where he bled for us. His heart bleeds for us, but still generously grants us a pardon for our treason in a season where the world tries to explain the spirit with human reasoning, but they can't, because the spirit is like the wind and the wind cannot be seen. But loved is the one who believes without seeing the unseen. I'm telling you, Jesus is something more. He's something great, and if you want to meet him, you don't have to wait. He stands at the narrow path with the key to the gate, and you only have to reach out and embrace his grace. I don't care who's the strongest or who's the fastest, Nothing matches the beauty of the Creator's immortal, infinite status. I don't care about religious leaders who died and stayed dead. I'm only going to worship the one who conquered death and wears a crown on his head. His name is Jesus. He's, he was faithful yesterday, and he's faithful today. I can feel his presence whenever I pray. And when it's time for me to fade away, I'll remember the day I heard him say, My name is Jesus. It's better than me. 
week has just been sorry, has been really just amazing. This I have never actually felt like I've gotten this close to God in forever. I've tapped into realms that <laughs> sorry, it's just a little bit.
let's our ushers, we have some ushers lined up. If not, grab some plates and we'll come to the front and we'll give it up to the Lord. In Jesus' name. Let's pray. Lord God, we love you today. We thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your many blessings upon us. That you're, you bless our finances. And Lord God, we will give back into your kingdom what you have blessed us with. In Jesus' name, bless the giver. Bless, bless this offering. In Jesus' name, let it be for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. You come and give. <laughs>
awesome time in the Holy Ghost the last several nights. I really can't remember any more blessed youth weeks than what we're having this year. And the Holy Ghost tells me that God wants to do some miracles among us tonight. Now, please don't, please don't just sign off because God has something he's going to do very special. It's a breakthrough in somebody's life tonight that will mean so much. And I wonder how many of you would just lift your hands with me right now. And let's believe God. Young people, you're great young people. Let's lift our voices right now. And let's give God the praise that he's worthy of receiving. Hallelujah. Oh, Father, we give you praise and glory and honor. You are the great and mighty God. There's nothing you cannot do. I give you praise and glory. Honor. Hallelujah. Praise God. We have a couple of little Actually, it looks like one little quilt for a... Oh, there's another bag. All right, two of them for uh, Arabella and Gabella. I, I might be saying that wrong. Gabriella, the, the Cox twins. Someone brought a couple of quilts. I'd like the elders to come. We're going to anoint these in Jesus' name for their continued healing. Also, we're going to pray for Sister Maureen Davis, who was taken to the hospital by ambulance just a few hours ago with pneumonia. And thankfully, uh, is Ryan here? Brother Ryan Davis here yet? Uh, I think he's coming. He may be a little late. But he uh, made the decision to get his mother to the hospital. It was a very crucial decision because she was... Uh, full of pneumonia but I know that God is touching her and I just was at the hospital praying for her then we're also going to pray tonight for little Jaslyn Jafrida that God would continue to touch her and heal her we know that God is doing a work and we believe that God is doing a work in her praise God and I thank God for what he's doing in each and every one of you here tonight those of you who need miracles how many need a miracle either for yourself or for a loved one hold your hand up you need a miracle for yourself or for a loved one all right then if you'd hold your hand up and let's go to God in prayer right now hallelujah praise the name of Jesus for Gabriella and Arabella Cox we anoint these quilts with oil in the name of Jesus according to the precedent set in the word of God in the name of Jesus the Lord Jesus Christ that healing that healing power come to these twins we pray in the name of Jesus for Gabriella and Arabella Cox that they will be completely and totally healed and we thank you for it Lord in the name of Jesus praise God praise God praise God now father we pray for Jaslyn Jafrida we ask oh God for her complete and total healing we believe in you father that you are doing a great work and we thank you for this work we ask oh Lord for her total and complete healing in the name of Jesus father even now send your healing power into that hospital room hallelujah father we give you the praise we ask for your healing power to go into the hospital room of Sister Maureen Davis right now, healing her body in the name of Jesus completely. Father, take every bit of pneumonia away in the name of Jesus Christ. God, everyone here that needs a miracle tonight, whether it be the infilling of the Holy Ghost or whether it be a miracle of healing or whether it be a miracle in their family, Oh, God, in the name of Jesus, we praise you, Father. We ask, oh, God, that you would send these miracles. We believe you for it. Now, Lord, we bind every foul and unclean spirit that would try to hinder the people of God from receiving. Lord, this is your city. This is your people. In the name of Jesus, let the Lord Jesus come now and fill this place 
Hallelujah. Every cubic inch of this place, oh Lord, and every heart in this place, and every body in this place, be filled with the Holy Ghost and let us arise and shine for our light is come and the glory of the Lord is risen upon us and we give you praise hallelujah in the precious name that's above all names the name of Jesus we'll have time to sing some more after brother near is done preaching tonight I want to add my voice to thank the youth team brother sister Cole and the youth staff, they have done a tremendous job. I can't say it doesn't get any better because I believe it's going to get better and better until the rapture, but I believe this has been an excellent, excellent youth week, and I want you to know tonight is a very important night for you. It's a very important night for you. Thank you, staff. Thank you, Brother and Sister Cole. Thank you to the young people. I, I am just amazed. I have been listening to their singing and their talents, and I'm thinking, wow, we're going to get these young people more involved. They've been kind of hidden a little bit too much. So I've been, Brother Shane Stoops and myself, we've been talking. We're going to uh, get these young people more involved than what they ever have been before. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Brother Cole, do you have anything to say before we bring the preacher up here? He sends his thanks to all of you. And also, I want to thank all of our guests that are here tonight. I so happy that you've come to be with us and all the saints of God who are here tonight to support our young people. Thank you. If there ever was an hour that our young people need to feel that support, it's right now. And you have it, young people. You're the best. Hallelujah. How many is ready to have Brother Near come and preach tonight? All right. We're happy to have Brother Near with us. I'm glad that he came to Maine, and we're definitely going to plan on having him back if the Lord tarries. But Brother Near, come and bring whatever the Lord lays on your heart. In the name of Jesus. Well, come on, let's clap for Jesus, everybody. Come on, on this last night of Youth Week 2016, would you just let your voice out and your praise be lifted up to God. Unto the King eternal, immortal, invisible, unto the only wise God, be all glory and honor and praise forever and ever. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, haven't we been having a move of God? Amen. But I believe that God is a God that's able to exceed His own greatness. And we've just been touching are scratching the surface of what God is about to do with you, with this church, and with His bride and His body. Amen. And I truly believe that. I'm so thankful once again. I want to just keep reiterating that this is truly a privilege to be able to speak to the people of God. And uh, I, I take it as a high honor to come back a second time this year and be with you, the lovely people of God here in Augusta, and those that have gathered with us, visitors, guests, thank you for spending your time and sacrificing that precious commodity of time to be here with us. And friends, new friends, old friends, and Pastor Stoops and Sister Stoops, if you're a visitor here, you owe it to yourself to come back and hear this man of God, Pastor Stoops, preach the Word of God. He is mightily anointed and used of God and has been, and he has been faithful all these years. So I'm thankful. I'm thankful for Pastor uh, Pastor Stoops, his wife, his family, my friend Shane Stoops, and also uh, someone I've drawn, grown kind of close to this few couple of days, and uh, uh, Brother Cole and his wife, and uh, their lovely, lovely family, and lovely Lily. Amen. There she is. How you doing? 
she kind of tides me over till I get back home to Iowa to get my little girl that's three years old. Amen. Amen. And my son Nathan, I'm, I'm looking forward to getting back with them. So uh, I, I just think that the Lord has one more just kind of just thrust forward so we can keep this going. How many are ready for the word of the Lord? Amen. The Bible says in Galatians 4, it talks about that a son and a servant differeth nothing while that son is young. But that son is placed under tutors and governors until that appointed time where he is, though he be Lord of all, there's an appointed time where he gets to inherit what's been his the whole time. And I believe God is going to do some things tonight and in this church in the next couple of months. And not because Brother Near is here or was here, but because it's time. It's time. It is the appointed time. The difference between servants and sons. A servant says, this is what I do. But a son says, this is who I am. And if I could ever draw, draw or just pound anything into our thinking is this isn't what we do but this is who we are and if we ever understand that we'll know that it's our time amen amen if you have your bibles one more time would you turn to the book of second kings once again second kings and chapter 13 and verse 14 thank you so much young people for your response to the word of god but if you have ever responded to the word it must be tonight amen it must be tonight you have impressed me you have challenged me you you've caused me to realize that there are things in me that i did not know was there and that includes aching body parts and muscles i never knew existed Amen. I did not get to see the video, uh, the video of them showing. I did a couple flips once. I landed on my face. Amen. But I got back up and tried again. Second Kings chapter 13 and verse 14. The Bible says now. Everybody say now. Whenever the Bible says now, take notice. Now Elisha was fallen sick of his sickness whereof he died. And Joash, the king of Israel, came down unto him and wept over his face and said, O oh, my father, my father, the chariots of Israel and the horsemen thereof. And Elisha said unto him, Take bow and arrows. And he took unto him bow and arrows. And he said to the king of Israel, Put thine hand upon the bow. And guess what he did? He put his hand upon it. And Elisha put his hands upon the king's hands. And he said, open the window eastward. And guess what he did? He opened it. Then Elisha said, shoot. And guess what? He shot. And he said, the arrow of the Lord's deliverance and the arrow of deliverance from Syria. For thou shalt smite the Syrians in Aphek till thou have consumed them. And he said, take the arrows. And he took them. And he said unto the king of Israel, smite upon the ground. And he smote thrice and stayed. Everybody say, he stayed. And the man of God was wroth with him and said, thou shouldest have smitten five or, or six times. You should have emptied your quiver. Then hadst thou smitten Syria, till thou hadst consumed it. But whereas thou shalt smite Syria, but thrice. In the beginning portion of verse 20, and Elisha died. If you'll skip to the New Testament, Luke chapter 17, in verse 10. In verse 10, just a little bit of context for the text that I just read to you. The Bible says, so likewise, we've heard about that word this weekend. So likewise, ye, when ye shall have done all those things which are commanded you. Everybody say, commanded you. Say, we are unprofitable servants. We have done that which was our duty to do. If I was a fancy preacher, I'd preach deliverance 
from the unprofitable. But since I'm not, I'll just preach this tonight. Going beyond, I have to. Would you throw your hands up in the air and would you pray the prayer of faith in this house? Father, in the name of Jesus, we come to you one more time during this youth week. And we're asking your anointing, O oh God, to articulate revelation and bring understanding that would challenge our faith and expand the perimeters of what we believe that you are able to do in this house. Lord, we bind every hindering spirit, whether human or demonic. We bind the spirit of fear and anxiety, O oh God. And we ask that you would that you would exceed your own greatness this night. And cause the word to come off of this two dimensional page and become a three dimension a three dimensional entity that we can take hold of it and we can carry it with us and make it a part of who we are tonight and everybody said in Jesus name bump your neighbor and say are you ready amen and you may be seated if you so desire I mentioned a little bit earlier about a daughter that I have that's three years old and a son that is five. My daughter's about to turn four this Saturday. I make it back just in time to celebrate with her turning four. And my son is about to turn six. But being as young as they are in the, the, the line of duty that we are called to we travel across the country and we spend most of our lives and are used to but most of our lives traveling from church service to church service prayer meeting to prayer meeting and with them traveling with us Nathan and Natalie Joe traveling with us they have developed what we I would like to call a drug problem as young as they are, yes, I can say it, they, they have a drug problem. They get drugged to every service that we're a part of. They get drugged to every prayer meeting. They get drugged most time to youth services. And, and they, have a, they have a drug problem. They are most of the time when they sit in service, it's not because they made a conscious decision that, hey, I'm going to go to church tonight. But they are forced to because that's what they have to because of who their mother and who their father is. And with that understanding, understanding of a drug problem I was privileged to be able to preach a what they called a PK retreat where the the pastor's kids of many churches gathered together and gathering together they they uh, did a special set of services for all these PKs that most of them had drug problems and in that service, there was, at the end of that service, there was a young lady that grew up in a pastor's home. And she grew up in this preacher's home. And that's what she knew. It's what she did. And she came up to us at the end of this serve, or at the end of a service. And she said to me and Sister Near, she said, would you pray for me, Brother Near and Sister Near? Because there is a problem that's going on in my stomach. Uh, I've not been able to eat right. Uh, and every time that I take a bite of food, a couple bites into a meal I have extreme pain in my stomach and, it, and it's been going on for months and I need God to do something tonight because they've done endoscopies or whatever they call it and they've looked at my stomach and there's discoloration in my stomach like a watermelon how it's kind of green, light green, dark green it's pink, dark pink and they don't know what it is and I said okay we'll pray and we prayed for that young lady and when we prayed God did something because after she had left she went home and she ate food with her parents and she was able to eat her whole meal and she she messaged me on Facebook the next day and she said brother near I ate I ate dinner last night I ate breakfast this morning and there's no more pain God did a miracle in my body and she said I'm can completely healed and I can tell you today that she is still whole but here's the thing why God did a miracle when we prayed for her not one time did we pray for her stomach 
We didn't pray for her stomach because the stomach wasn't the issue. We prayed for that spirit of fear and anxiety to lift up off of her. And when that spirit of fear and anxiety, fear is a, an understanding of a present danger and anxiety is a fear of something that might be, that may not be. So when we prayed and that lifted off, all of a sudden God healed because there are often times that, that, that there are spiritual problems that are manifest in a, in a physical nature. So I, wanna, I want you to understand because she had grown up in a preacher's home and this was what she did, but it, no, it was not yet who she was. Amen. So with this being said, I want to go a little bit further into my next statement. Just because you're saved does not mean that you're delivered. Just because you're saved does not mean that you're delivered. Just like in the Old Testament. How many know that the Old Testament, the Bible says, the Old Testament or the law is the schoolmaster that brings us unto Christ. It is the tutor and the governor that brings us unto an understanding of who we are as sons so we can inherit that appointed time. So in the Old Testament, how many know the story of Moses and the parting of the Red Sea? In Moses, the people of God in Egypt did you know that there was a death angel that was going to pass over but for them to escape the judgment of a death angel they had to take a lamb and they had to slay that lamb and they had to take the blood of that lamb and they had to apply it to the doorpost and when that death angel passed over they would look and they, that death angel would see the blood and would pass over that's just like when we have the slain blood of the lamb that Jesus was the lamb slain from the foundation of the world and we take his blood the lamb slain that the blood of the lamb and we apply it to our lives when we go down in the water in the name of Jesus we apply that same slain lamb's blood to our life in baptism aren't you thankful that we can have the same blood applied to our life and we can escape the judgment but not only did they have to have the slain blood of the lamb applied to their house like we have it applied to our hearts, but they not only had to have the slain blood of the lamb, but they had to have what they, what they did next was they took the lamb and they ate it to the full. That's like what we do after we apply the blood of the lamb. We've got to not only have the blood of the lamb, but we've got to get the lamb on the inside to the full. So we've not only got to be baptized in Jesus name but we've got to receive the Holy Ghost which is the lamb on the inside and I wonder if there's anybody thankful for the Holy Ghost or the lamb on the inside and the blood applied on our hearts but here's the thing that even though in Egypt they had a typology of baptism in Jesus' name, applying the blood of the lamb, and then having the lamb on the inside. And guess what? If they had too much lamb for them to take in by themselves, he said, you better go get your neighbor. I'm telling you, we've got more than enough lamb to go around. We've got more than enough lamb for just you and just for me. But he said, you go knock on your neighbor's house and say, hey, we've got some lamb. We've got something we need you to help partake. But even though they had the lamb's blood applied and they had the lamb on the inside, they still were in Egypt. They needed a deliverance. They needed a bust out. So that's where it brings me to our text. The Bible said, now. Everybody say, now. Now, Elisha. This was the same Elisha 
that 60 years prior had followed the man Elijah the prophet that mighty man of God this Elisha 60 years prior had followed him seeking after his mantle in the ministry that he possessed he wanted a double portion of what he had so he followed him he poured waters on his hands and served him but it was 60 years prior following this man of God that he was given an opportunity to settle for going to Gilgal he said I'm going to Bethel the old man of God the elder man of God the prophet Elijah said just stay here Elijah at Gilgal Gilgal represents a reinstituted covenant that means salvation he said, just stay here at Gilgal. But Elisha said, no, I'm not going to settle for just being saved. But I'm going to follow you as the Lord liveth and as thy soul liveth. He said, I will not leave thee. And they both went to Bethel. Bethel means the house of God. And he said, hey, Elisha, just stay here at Bethel. And he said, no, as the Lord liveth, as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. In other words, uh, that young man said, I'm not going to settle for just being saved and I'm not going to settle for just coming to the house of God because I know there's more and the Bible said they both went to Jericho. Jericho was a place of historical significance and moves of God in the past past victories a past generation's victories and moves of God but guess what he said oh, young man just stay here at Jericho I'm going over Jordan but Elisha said no 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 as the Lord liveth as thy soul liveth I will not leave thee in other words I'm not satisfied with just being saved or just coming to the house of God I'm not satisfied even with somebody else's move of God and somebody else's victories or a past generation's historical landmarks but I've got to go over Jordan with you I want to see it for myself I want what you have and they both went over together as he smote that water with his mantle they walked over on dry shod and on the other side of Jordan because he was willing to press beyond Gilgal, Bethel, and Jericho. Now an opportunity is presented to that young man. A blank check, if you will. He says, now you've come this far. What would you ask of me before I go? What would you want? And he said, I want a double portion of your spirit upon me. And that was something that had never been asked before because nobody knew that they could have what Elijah had. But this young man said, I want a double portion of what you had he asked something that was not bound by past experiences or past precedents that had already been said but he said I want more than anybody's ever asked for he said if I'm going to have a blank check I'm going to put a couple extra zeros on there because it's available and I have access to it now and he said you've asked a hard thing but if you see me when I go you'll have it let me stop here and make a point. What Elijah just said, he said, oh, it's a hard thing, not impossible. But if you want it, you can have it. But he said, "Don't get." He said, keep your eyes on me. If you see me when I go, it's going to be yours. But here's the thing. He said, don't get caught up with the fire. Don't get caught up with the wind. Don't get caught up with the chariots. Don't get caught. But keep your eye on the relationship that brought you this far. Don't get caught up with the gifts and don't get caught up with the anointing. Don't get caught up, but keep your eye on the relationship that brought you this far but now on the other side of Jordan with a blank check presented to him with passion he said I want double portion of what your spirit is upon me he sees that opportunity but the Bible says now Elisha was fallen sick with the sickness whereof he would die. And by this dying prophet, 60 years later, by this dying prophet's deathbed, he sits a king, a young man that would be a representation for the next generation. He looks over that dying prophet and he says to him, Oh, my father, my father, the chariots of Israel and the horsemen thereof. And that may not mean much to you, but that meant something to that dying prophet. 
Because what that king just said was the same words that 60 years prior he said moments before he would take up a mantle. When he seen the chariots of fire take his Elijah away, he cried out, My father, my father, the chariots of Israel and the horsemen thereof. That's the same words that this king said over the 60 years later in this dying prophet's deathbed. My father. Father, my father, echoing a past generation's passion, saying, I want what you have. And I can see Elisha. I could see him just laying there sick. I could see him just keeled over, just, oh, re, re, just, oh, oh. But that young generation says, my father, my father, and speaks the same terminology of faith that was spoken in a previous generation. And I see Elisha sitting up saying, what'd you say? And all of a sudden I see a prophet, his strength returning to him. I, I feel like there's strength coming back to Pastor Stoops right now to have this revival. If there will be a generation that will say the same faith that was spoken by him when he first came to Augusta, if we can repeat that same terminology of faith, it will cause us strength. See, this, this youth week isn't just for the youth because when the youth uh, begins to speak the same thing that the elders once spoke, uh, it will cause a strength uh, to come back into every one of our elders uh, and one of our faithful saints. Uh, but he said and spoke the same thing. I see Elisha sitting up. What'd you say? It's in your mouth. So let's see now if it's in your heart. And he says to him, to this young king, he says, take bow and arrows. We're going to see. And guess what that young man does? He takes bow and arrows. And then he says to that young man, he said, put your hand upon the bow. And guess what? He put his hand upon the bow. And then he says to him, now, open the window eastward. And guess what he did? He did exactly that. He opened the window eastward. And then he said, shoot. And guess what he did? Are you catching the pattern? Take bow and arrows. He took bow and arrows. He said, put your hand on the bow. He put his hand on the bow. He said, open the window eastward. He opened the window eastward. He said, shoot. And guess what he did? And once he shot that one arrow, that left him with a quiver of six arrows because quivers, a full quiver is seven. So he shot one. He's got six left over. And he says to him, watch now. Behold, the arrow of the Lord says, you got it up there? I don't want to misquote it and people think I'm, no, go back. And he take the arrows took and said, blah, 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 upon the ground. no, go back, go back, go back, go back. Oh, there we go. And he opened it. Then he lost shoot and he shot. And he said, the arrow of the Lord's deliverance. In other words, he said to him, do you understand what you're doing? They were not even engaged in battle yet. But he shot an arrow because he was saying, the arrow of the Lord's deliverance in the deliverance of Syria. In other words, we're not just playing with arrows right now. But what you're doing right now, you're winning wars that you're not even engaged in yet. He said, you can win some battle. That's how the prophetic works. He said, there there's going to be some things that happen tonight that are going to win wars that you'll be facing tomorrow. There's some things you can do tonight, young people, in Church of Augusta. You can win some battles and gain some deliverance of things you're not even in war with yet. But uh, what happens tonight can determine your tomorrow. Does that make sense? So he's saying we're not just playing with arrows and then once he makes that point clear he says take arrows and hands him a quiver full and he takes arrows just like he was doing in this pattern that he was now following and he takes that arrow he said smite the ground and you know what that young man did he went okay I guess if I have to okay I know this is kind of silly but Dap, dap, dap. <laughs> if I have to, 
I'll do it to kind of appease my pastor. I'll, I'll do it to kind of appease a past generation. And I'll dap, dap, dap. I know it looks silly, but I'll do it just because everybody's doing it. And I'm just dap, dap, dap. And he hit it three times and stayed. And all of a sudden, that dying prophet says, Oh! If you would have only smitten the ground five or six times, thou would have completely smitten Syria. But now you will end up bound in the end. Oh yeah, you'll have a good youth week. Oh yeah, you'll have a few more good services after youth week's gone. But if you don't empty your quiver... Oh, yeah, you'll have a few good victories. But if you would have emptied your quiver, you would have had complete deliverance. But now you're only going to have a good youth week and a few good song services from here on out. But you're going to end up bound because you didn't take care of what you needed to take care of. Oh, if you had only smitten it five or six times. Because watch now, three times he smitten. That means there was six in a quiver because he already shot one. In other words, here's the thing. He only did half of what he could have. Because he was following the pattern of only doing what he thought he had to do. Just doing what he thought he had to to try to appease a past generation. Just doing what he thought he had to to maybe even appease pastor. And just staying there but going no further. You said take bow and arrows. I took bow and arrows. You said put your hand on the bow. I put my hand on the bow. You said open the window eastward. I did that. I opened the window eastward. You said shoot. I shot. And he was doing everything to the T that was asked of him. But when he was handed a quiver full he only did half of what he could have because he was into the unprofitable pattern of only doing what he thought he had to. What does this translate into? This translates into Luke 17. And Luke 17 where Jesus is saying, So likewise ye, when you have done all that is commanded you. Those things shall have done all those things which are commanded you say we are unprofitable that means there's no gain it means unworthy not good it doesn't matter our unprofitable servants we have done that which is our duty to do he said when you've done everything you're supposed to do you took the bow you put your hand on it you opened the window you've done everything that you're supposed to do you're still unprofitable in other words there's no gain there's nothing good coming out of it you're just an unprofitable servant but I don't believe that the Bible is talking Jesus is talking about you doing more but I believe he's talking about the approach in which you're doing what you're already doing Because when you're a servant, everything you do is a duty. But when you're a son, everything that you do is a delight. Because when you're only doing what you have to, you're a servant. But sons say, yeah, that's what, that, this is who I am. And when you understand you're not a servant, but you're a son, everything that they consider a duty, it's a delight to you. Because unprofitable servants that do only what they have to do, they know the price of living for God. They know the cost of living for God. But when you go beyond just uh, what I have to, and you step into the understanding that I get to, there is an understanding beyond the price, and it's called the privilege. And when you step into the privilege of being a son, all your duty becomes your delight. And all Let me help. Let's go a little bit further because I don't want what I do for God to be unprofitable in his eyes. That's why he said Jesus was talking on the mount or, or, or the mount, the Beatitudes when he, when he was sharing that sermon on the mount trying to create a culture 
of Christ trying to change their thinking. That's why Jesus came and he said, you've heard it said, but I say unto you. You've heard it said, but I say unto you. And on that Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5 and verse 40, he says it like this. If a man sue thee at the court of law and take away thy coat, let him have thy cloak also. He was talking about the undershirt and the outer garment. He said, if a man come to you and sue you at a court of law for your undershirt, by law, you have to. You're bound by the law. You have to. If a man sue thee at the court of law, I have to. But Jesus said, don't stop there. By law, I got to do that. I have to do that. I'm bound to. I have to. But he said, you want to know how you get deliverance from I have to? I get to do this. No, you didn't hear it. You didn't hear it. He said, by law, if he sue me, I have to. This is what I have to. But guess what? This is what I do, but this is who I am. I have to do this. But because of who I am in Christ, I get to do I have to. This one I get to. That's where liberty comes in. When you get beyond what you have to and you make it something that I get to. I choose to. I'm still bound by the law. I've got to get the shirt. So there are some things that are a necessity that you have to do. But don't be bound in just what you have to. Because you'll, you'll know the price. Oh, you'll know the price of walking with God and the cost of living for God and the sacrifice. But if you stay there, you'll never know the privilege. And you'll know you know the price, but you'll never know the privilege. And that's why you'll watch them get 18 and walk away. Because they've only known the price, but never the privilege. So Jesus goes a little bit further to make a doctrine out of it. He says, go beyond I have to. The shirt's because I have to. The jacket's because I'm not going to be bound by what I have to. But I get to do this. I'm going to go above and beyond. I'm going to one up you because not, it's not who I, what I do, but it's who I am. And then he goes on a little bit further and watch what he says in the next verse. Whosoever shall compel thee to go a mile, go with him twain. One translation says like this, if a soldier forces you to carry his pack for one mile, go two. Because the Roman soldiers had a law that if they asked you being a Jew, not a Roman citizen, you to carry my stuff, you by law have to carry my stuff for one mile. And think of how heavy that must have been have to carry your enemy's stuff for one mile by law. Think about that. That's pretty heavy. It's kind of like this. I'm going to take this chair right here. If a man forced thee by law for you to carry it one mile, you have to. The first miles, I have to. And anything you carry because you have to makes it infinitely heavier and we carry a bunch of stuff because we have to and it gets heavy and it gets too heavy to carry and we are waiting for that first mile to be over just so we can set it down kind of like our young people we carry the I have to and we carry until we get 18 because it's too heavy holiness is too heavy when it's I have to standards of righteousness are too heavy when I have to walking with God is too heavy when I have to so we'll see them carry it as long as they have to but they'll get done with their first mile and they'll take everything and just set it down and they think that's deliverance that's not deliverance but that's what we do we have to we have to and it gets heavy because we weren't I have to I have to but Jesus said yeah go that one mile and it's going to be heavy but 
don't stop there. Deliverance doesn't come when you get 18 or you get out of mom and dad's house and you set it down and say, I don't have to do that anymore. I don't have to live like that anymore. I don't have to serve them like that anymore. Even the smallest things are too heavy to be carried when you've got an I have to mentality. But Jesus said, don't set it down, but go even further. Don't go, I have to, in the first mile. He said, go a second mile. The second mile I get to, I choose to. And when you take on a second mile mentality, everything becomes infinitely lighter because nobody's making you do this, but you made up your mind. This is not what I do, but this is who I am. He said, don't stop at one mile. You make up your mind and choose to go that second mile because you're bound in the first, but the second mile. That first mile, it's heavy. But you want to know how you're going to have deliverance tonight? Getting a second mile mentality while you're still walking the first And I don't care what that man of God would ask of you that he feels in the Holy Ghost. Nothing will be too heavy. Nothing will be too much when you've got a second mile in sight. When you've got a second mile that you're looking forward to. My God, when you've got a second mile in mind, you've got the privilege in sight. You've got the... Oh, you're not hearing me right now. Give me my check. Need that second mile. Oh, you're not hearing me. I think I don't know what I'm talking about. That's why I was in that PK retreat. And in that PK retreat, there was a young lady that her mom and dad forced her to be there. And she came. She came. And she sat on that service. Her face was literally, her countenance was distorted. She, was, she didn't want to be there. But I'm telling you, the angel of the Lord's deliverance swept in that house. And, and God started moving in that place. And that young lady, she said, okay, I'm going to go to that front. And I'm going I'm to pray. I don't want to be here. But I'm going to make up my mind, not because my mom and dad asked me to, but I'm choosing to. She came up to that front. She threw her hands up in the air. To my surprise, I looked at that pastor's kid's arm as she had, scrut she had cut her wrist uh, trying to get out of a first mile. But didn't know how. That's where God gave me this message for this generation. That we're so bound on what we think we have to do. And we're just trying to appease our parents. Trying to appease our pastors. And trying to appease a past generation's way of doing things. But guess what? That's too heavy of a burden for you to carry. But when you can take all of that. And you can put it on your shoulders and say, this isn't because I have to. I don't have to do this, but I choose to do this. And when you start walking in that, you'll run laps around those fake Christians. you walk laps around them. And you... And all of a sudden, when you start entering into that second mile, you say, load it up. It's a privilege to serve God. Load it up. Do I have to? Do I have to be baptized in Jesus' name? Have to? You get to have your sins washed away. Do I have to receive the Holy Ghost speaking with other tongues to go to heaven? Have to? You get to have the God of glory. Feel the... Oh. Do I have to live holy? Do I get... Do I have to? I get to be an ambassador of the glory of God. My God, somebody, you ought to break out. This isn't what I have to do, but I choose. Go ahead. Go ahead. I wonder if somebody's still ready to run. God got you running last night because you had to, but why don't you choose to? Come on, let's clap, clap our hands to Jesus right now.
Are you ready to go a little bit further? And be seated one more second. Because watch now. When Jesus said in Luke 17 and 10, so likewise ye, when you've done everything that was commanded you, say we're unprofitable. In other words, there's no profit when you're just doing it because you have to. It's no coincidence that the next verse and the next story is the ten lepers. And the ten lepers, they see Jesus afar off. And they say, hey Jesus, Jesus, lepers. They had learned to live with loss. Leprosy is that disease and that puts you in a constant state of loss. Is there anybody in here that knows anything about loss? They lived in a constant state of loss. Diminishing. But they seen Jesus walking. And they said, Jesus, have mercy on us. And the Bible said that Jesus, he lifted his voice and he said, Go show yourselves to the priest. And he commanded them to go show themselves to the priest. And you know what they started doing? Go show ourselves to the priest. And they started doing what was commanded them. And watch now. When they did what they had to do, all of a sudden they realized they were healed. So you can be healed in the process of loss stop by just doing what you have to but guess what they may have been healed but they weren't whole they still were feeling the effects of loss even though they weren't losing anymore they were still scarred by the things that they'd lost in the past so I'm telling you as long as you just be a good Christian you dot your I's you cross your T's you pay your tithes you'll be alright the loss will stop but guess what that don't mean you're whole so while they're on their way doing what they had to do one got the bright idea while the others were walking the first he said I think I ought to walk a second mile and he turned back towards Jesus and he said I'm going to go and give some thanks because it's not enough for me to be healed but there's a second mile that says I can be whole and he came to Jesus and he fell on his face and began to give glory to God nobody asked him nobody commanded him but he did it out of his own desire to be whole and I wonder if there's a church that's willing to go beyond just healing but say, hey, I've lost some things and the only way to get them back is a second mile. Because once they walked that second mile and he began to give glory to God when it was not asked of him, Jesus said, Bubba, your faith made you whole. He had all his fingers back. He had his ear back. That part of his nose was back. Everything that he lost. All because of a second mile. And that's what brings me to this point. Jesus is about to come back. Is there a young unmarried lady here somewhere. Young man. Seeing a couple just kind of do this. You just right here. Okay, I'm gonna use you. You're ready for that wedding day. It's paid for. You spent 13 hours on your hair. You paid for the rent, the facilities. You've got Pastor Stoops lined up. I you got all this stuff and everything, and you've been preparing. But then all of a sudden, when I got married, and my wife stood at the back of that church, in her grandpa's church, and she'd spent all the money that she did, and she did all the preparations that she had, looking fine like a fox that she was. Uh-huh. And her father grabbed her by the hand and was about to walk her down the aisle and had to do this number. Come on. Resist me. Don't, don't come on. 
Come on, honey, we paid too much for this. Come on, you've got to, you did your hair, you got your dress on, you're ready, but why don't, why don't you just come on? If her father, my wife's father had to do that to get her to an altar, I'd say off with you, I'm going to find somebody that will. Because Jesus isn't coming back for a bride that's reluctant to love him and reluctant to live for him. But he's looking for somebody not that has to, but I love him, so I get to. Not because I have to, but I love him. I'm running down that aisle. I'm jumping, waiting, telling Paul. Oh. And he's not going to judge, dra drag Augusta to up to an altar and make you love him. He doesn't want a reluctant bride. He wants somebody that's ready to run. Musicians, would you come, please? It's about to happen in this house. Are you ready? Quick, musicians, run. Run. So now, Elisha, about to die, die with a double portion at his bedside sits a young king a generation that wants what he has they want his harvest but they don't want his seed that generation says the same faith my father, my father, the chariots of Israel, the horsemen thereof, you're about to be taken away, and I want what you have. So Elisha says, take bow and arrows. And he did that. He took bow and arrows. Put your hand on the bow. He put his hand on the bow. Open the window eastward. He opened the window eastward. He was doing everything that was asked of him. He shot the arrow when he was asked. But then, with a quiver full, he says that generation, he says, take arrows. And they took arrows and he said, now, smite the ground. You know what Elisha was doing? Elisha was giving that generation the same opportunity that he had 60 years prior. The same blank check in that young man, he took an arrow a quiver full every opportunity and he went Gilgal Bethel Jericho and stayed willing to settle for a past generation's victories willing to settle for somebody else's walk with God and after he smote the ground three, three times and stayed that prophet said oh Oh, if anchored youth would have only smitten that ground five or six times. If they would have only gone beyond what was asked of them. And that prophet died angry. Because a generation that was presented with the same opportunity. There was passivity found where passion once dwelt. Please don't let Brother Near leave here. While God's handing you a quiverful, saying you have every opportunity to be healed. You have every opportunity in this house to leave full of the Holy Ghost. You have every, every visitor, every saint, every young person. God has given you every opportunity in this service saying, I'm giving you a quiverful. Brother Cole, come here. this in the Holy Ghost God is handing this church an opportunity but your depth of deliverance will be determined by you so he's handing this generation a quiver but now he's saying 
take arrows. I want you to spread out and will our elders and our everybody, will you just kind of get back behind all of them and I want you to just step forward. Come on, everybody. Come on, bring your families. Bring, bring your guests, bring your visitors and come. And I want the young people, I want you to stand up front next to this altar and spread out. And I want our elders to come behind us. The adults, would you please come? In a moment, the angel of the Lord's deliverance is going to sweep into this house. But what you get out of this service will be determined by you tonight. All that God has done this week, this is the culminating night of services of this particular youth week. But you're not here because you have to. God has asked you to make a commitment, not because somebody commanded you or you, you have to, but tonight you're going to say, I choose to. You've got an opportunity tonight. You can take that arrow that's in your hand and you could just dab, dab, dab. But with the same passion that took up a mantle at the feet of Elijah and as the chariots of fire, my father, my father, the chariots of Israel. God wants to see the same passion that was found in a man of God that took up a mantle. He's given you the same opportunity as a church and as a people. But what will you do with it? So in a moment, I'm going to ask you to smite the ground. And when you begin to smite that ground with every hit of the arrow, there's going to be a deliverance that gets deeper and deeper and deeper. And when it gets deeper and deeper, at the depth of your deliverance will be the height of your impartation. And when you're done hitting that arrow, I want you to turn to somebody and give it to them and switch places. And God is going to allow something to sweep through this house that's absolutely going to deliver and it's going to heal. And if you need the Holy Ghost, I want every hand lifted high right now. Do you feel faith in this house or no? Are you ready, young people? Are you ready to seize your opportunity and make this yours? Then smite the ground! No, smite the ground! Not because I have to. Not because Brother Near asked me to. But I need to.